Ladies, it's time to take coloring your hair at home to the next level with Madison Reed. You deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to your door and for less than $25. For decades, women have really just had two options for coloring their hair, outdated at-home color or the time and expense of going to a salon. Many Madison Reed clients comment how their new hair color has improved their lives for the better. Women love the results. Gorgeous, shiny, multi-dimensional, healthy-looking hair. This is gray covering, game-changing color you can do at home and look as if you just came from the salon. What makes Madison Reed color unique is that it's crafted by master colorists who blend nuances of light, dark, cool, and warm to create over 45 gorgeous multi-tonal shades. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Thread listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with code THREAD. That's code THREAD. It was a majestic summer evening in Manhattan in June 1906. The scene was like something torn from the pages of The Great Gatsby. A few hundred of New York's poshest citizens sat under the stars on the rooftop theater at the old Madison Square Garden. They were there for the premiere of a new musical. Stanford White, the wealthy owner of Madison Square Garden, sat at his reserved table in the front. The show was coming to an end with the final number, I Could Love a Million Girls. I heard him say so often that he could love their wives alone. But I think that is rubbish, mammoths have wars, but of snow. White cut a larger-than-life figure in turn-of-the-century New York. And he was a Harvey Weinstein of his age. He indulged his lavish appetites with impunity. And that included beautiful teenage girls. Oh, I could love a million girls and every girl a twin. I could love a Chinese girl and Eskimo orphan. I could love Stanford White's appetites were about to catch up with him. But in fact, I think that I could love about a million girls. People in the audience thought that the gunshots were part of the show at first. The music kept playing. I love the girl with legs long, a beauty just like you. Huh? Then there were a few screams, then panic. The magical evening atmosphere evaporated like a dream. A man wearing a black tuxedo, a white straw boater hat, and an overcoat far too heavy for a hot summer night raised a pistol over his head. The man screamed, I did it because he ruined my wife. It was an unforgettable night at Madison Square Garden. One millionaire murdered another millionaire in a fit of rage and jealousy. And that was just the start of the madness. Welcome back to The Thread, a podcast from Ozzy. I'm Sean Braswell. This season, we dig into some of history's most incredible criminal trials, ones that attempted to find a defendant not guilty by way of insanity. It's a criminal defense fraught with controversy, and it goes back over 200 years. Our thread this season began with the recent case of James Holmes, the young man who opened fire on a Colorado movie theater in 2012. Holmes suffered from a variety of delusions, but experts and the jury at his trial determined that Holmes knew the difference between right and wrong, and he was therefore not legally insane when he committed the crime. Part of the reason that even mentally ill defendants like Holmes face an uphill battle in pleading insanity is the public and legal reaction to the outcomes in two earlier insanity cases. In those two cases, which we covered in episodes two and three, both Lorena Bobbitt, who cut off her husband's penis with a kitchen knife, and John Hinckley Jr., who nearly killed President Ronald Reagan with a gunshot, were found not guilty of any crimes by reason of insanity. In this episode, we turn back the clock more than 70 years to the 1906 murder of Stanford White on the rooftop of Madison Square Garden. White's killer was an eccentric businessman from Pittsburgh named Harry Thaw. Thaw's wealthy family was prepared to pay a million dollars to spare him from the electric chair. 
they were also prepared to embrace an unorthodox legal strategy. Harry Thaw's murder trial and his insanity plea transfixed the American public and reimagined the criminal law. America was at a key turning point in its history in the early years of the 20th century. Paula Yuraburo is a professor of English and Film Studies at Hofstra University and the author of American Eve. I gave a recent talk and I decided to describe New York City at the turn of the century as uh, the city of the temples of power and temples of pleasure. And I would add progress because it was the century of progress. Huge fortunes were made in areas like banking, oil, railroads, and steel by men with names like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and Henry Clay Frick. And people who made their fortunes, such as Carnegie or Frick, would usually move to New York City from wherever they came from simply because New York was the most exciting and the most interesting place to be. Simon Botts is a professor of history at the John Jay College of Justice and author of The Girl on the Velvet Swing. And so New York City became really the repository of a huge amount of wealth as these multimillionaires moved to the city. And when they came here, what they did was they hired architects to build them luxurious houses and mansions. Stanford White was one of those architects. He was determined to sort of remake New York in his own image. White designed luxurious homes for wealthy clients like the Vanderbilts and the Astors. And uh, in addition to private houses, he, he designed a lot of public spaces, including uh, probably the most famous things are, that are still there as well, too, the Washington Square Arch, uh, the original Penn Station, and, uh, of course, Madison Square Garden, which was the sort of jewel in the crown of his uh, achievements as an architect. Madison Square Garden was a block-long entertainment complex in Manhattan. It had an enormous amphitheater where up to 17,000 spectators gathered for horse shows, boxing matches, and political meetings. There was a ballroom, a restaurant, a concert hall, an indoor theater, and an open-air rooftop theater. A large nude bronze statue of the goddess Diana loomed over the rooftop theater on top of a gleaming tower. Madison Square Garden made Stanford White a New York celebrity. He was very tall. He was very distinctive. He had... Um... Uh, striking red hair, and um, by all accounts, he was a very gregarious, charming, considerate individual. But at the same time, he had, I think, um, a self-destructive tendency inside his character. White's character was also destructive to others. The woman at the center of the love triangle that would result in White's murder said that he had vicious tendencies. He, quote, performed frequently without remorse, with the sense that he and his friends were immune to the laws of the land. That woman was Evelyn Nesbitt. She was born in uh, Tarentum, Pennsylvania, which was a suburb of Pittsburgh. And at least for the first 10 years of her life, it was a fairly traditional, I think, childhood. Paula Yurubiro again. But then her father died suddenly when she was 11, and she and her mother, and her, she had a younger brother, were thrown into poverty. It was sort of like a Dickens novel. Evelyn Nesbitt came to New York with her mother and brother in 1900. She was just 15. Simon Bartz. And immediately, Evelyn got employment as a model, uh, modeling for illustrators of magazines and newspapers, and also for artists. Nesbitt had a distinctive, effortless beauty that set her apart from the other models of her day. She had large, haunting eyes, a mysterious Mona Lisa half-smile, and an enchanting, angelic face. Everybody said, and now it's funny when you say it now, she had a face to die for, which was, of course, what, what was going to happen. But her face was her fortune, and her face was on the Whitman sampler, and her face was on sheet music, and it was on anything you could put a picture on. Nesbitt became an American sweetheart perhaps the nation's first true pinup girl. One columnist dubbed her a modern Helen, but she wanted more than that. She decided she wanted to be a chorus girl, like all young girls who come to the city, they want to be rich, they want to be famous. She managed to get into the chorus of the um, most popular show on Broadway at the time, which was called Floridora. Her mother lied about her age and said that she was 18 when she was only 16. As a chorus girl, Nesbitt became the object of even more men's affections. The owner of Madison Square Garden was no different. Stanford White saw her 
and was immediately sort of smitten with her. Unlike Nesbitt's other admirers, however, White had the means to pursue his crush. Stanford White invited her to lunch one day and gradually got to know her. And at this time, Stanford White was 47 years old and Evelyn Nesbitt was 16 years old. White's elaborate seduction of the beautiful teenager began at his Manhattan bachelor pad on West 24th Street. And that's where she met White for the first time, and he was showing around all of the um, beautiful rooms and things that he had decorated. It was, in, it was not a house that was known to his wife or his family. He called it one of his snuggeries. There were red velvet curtains and beautiful pieces of hand-carved Italian furniture. Fine paintings hung on the walls. After lunch, White invited Nesbitt upstairs to see more of his home and art collections, including a very special room on the top floor of the building. Simon Botsigan, author of The Girl on the Velvet Swing. So the whole of the fourth floor is open. It's like a room that goes from the front of the building to the back of the building, so it's a very large room. And there's a swing with a velvet padded seat with velvet ropes descending from the ceiling. Paul Yer Bureau again, author of American Eve. He showed her this red velvet swing that was put in the room so that you could push somebody on the swing. And then the, uh, in Evelyn's case, he put her on the swing that afternoon and he hung a Japanese paper parasol on the ceiling and she pushed her to see if she could break it with her foot. And you can get all Freudian about what that means, but, but that was the introduction that she had to White. White lavished more money and attention on the young woman after that first encounter. It was all part of a well-honed routine. Nesbitt later described it this way on the witness stand. Men like White reduced their methods to an exact science. He put her and her mother in an apartment. He sent her brother to school. He had her taking piano lessons. He was, he was what seemed like a very paternal benefactor, and you realize now that he was probably grooming her. The courtship went on for a few months. Then, White made his true intentions known. He was, as Nesbitt put it, a benevolent vampire. I think of him more like Roman Polanski. But I think of him as somebody who had, who was a, who was an artist and a genius and a lover of beauty. People knew that he had an eye for younger girls. One evening after her performance ended, Nesbitt arrived at White's home for a dinner party. But to her surprise, only White was waiting for her. He was apologetic. Isn't it too bad, he said, that all the others have turned us down? White informed Nesbitt that they would have their own party. He said to her, well, I want to show you another room. And she goes up this other set of stairs that she had never seen before. And there was this mirrored room with a mirrored bed and mirrors on the ceiling. There was a small table that stood next to an enormous four-poster canopied bed. There was a bottle of champagne on the table and a single glass. White poured Evelyn a glass of champagne. She sipped it. She tasted it. She didn't like the taste, but he asked her to tasted some more and she fell unconscious and then she woke up later to find herself naked in bed with Stanford White lying next to her. And Evelyn, the way she describes it is she said, I went into the room of virgin but I did not come out one. No one knows for sure if the champagne was drugged or not. Evelyn later maintained that she had just had too much of it. Whatever the cause, the result was the same. She woke up naked in the bed next to Sanford White and screamed. Her suitor tried to console her. He said tenderly, Don't cry, kittens. It's all over. Now you belong to me. The next thing she knew was that she was essentially White's mistress and was now a fixture at his parties um, and got to meet everybody from Edison to uh, Sitting Bull to Nijinsky. She was meeting all these incredible people. She was enjoying the high life and he was buying her furs and jewelry. Nesbitt began dating her patron and protector. But the following year, she met another wealthy man, one with his own score to settle against White. When it's time to make a hire for your small business, naturally you want to find the best person for the job. Odds are that person is on LinkedIn. Here at Aussie, where we weave each season of the thread, we depend on LinkedIn jobs to help us find the right person for our hiring needs, to put top talent at our fingertips. LinkedIn jobs makes it easy to get matched with quality candidates who make the most sense for your position. It goes beyond the resume. 
using knowledge of both hard skills and soft skills to match you with the people who fit your business the best. Your LinkedIn jobs matches are based not just on skills and background, but also on interests, activities, and passions. Matching lets you quickly get a group of the most relevant qualified candidates. That way, you can focus on the candidates you want to spend time talking to and make a quality hire you're excited about. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash thread and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash thread. Terms and conditions apply. Could listening make you a better parent, a better leader, or even a better person? Could listening inspire you to start something new? There's never been a better time to start listening on Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. With Audible, you get access to an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. For listeners of the thread who love history, I recommend you go to Audible and pick up Bearing the Cross, David Garrow's Pulitzer Prize winning biography of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. In season three of the thread about the history of nonviolent protest, we drew a lot from Garrow and his work on Dr. King. Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else. Listen on any device, anytime, anywhere, at home, at the gym, on your commute, or just on the go. Audible, the most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories, the best place to listen. Get started with a 30-day trial when you go to audible.com slash thread or text thread to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thread or text thread to 500-500 and listen for a change. Harry K. Thaw came from a wealthy Pittsburgh family. His father had made his money in mining and railroads. He was the heir to a $40 million fortune, um, and his, his father had died when Harry was 18, and he knew that there was something wrong with Harry, and he told his wife that Harry should be put on a, on a strict uh, budget in terms of an allowance. Something was definitely wrong with the young Harry Thaw. He would giggle when he heard about someone else's misfortune. He was known as Mad Harry. He once made the papers for chasing a man down the street with an unloaded shotgun because he believed he cheated him out of 10 cents change. He went to Harvard and spent most of his time smoking and playing poker there. He was expelled on grounds of moral turpitude. But there was no need for him to get a degree because his annual allowance was $80,000. He was basically a playboy. Thaw was a tall man with a boyish appearance, a pug nose, and an often idiotic grin. One Pittsburgh newspaper said he looked like a peeled turnip. Thaw felt that he was too big for Pittsburgh, and so he set his sights on New York. But his reputation really was in advance of him, and so he never got accepted into New York society. So he never got admission to any of the clubs, and usually that would be easy for a wealthy person to do. They would accept you, but he never got accepted. He was always blackballed. Part of it undoubtedly had to do with his personality. He had a very short fuse. He had a very angry temper. He would do things on a whim. For example, if, if he was in a restaurant and he didn't like the service, he would pull the tablecloth and all the dishes and cutlery would come clattering down onto the floor. There were other incidents. Thaw drove his car through the plate glass window of a shop on Fifth Avenue after an argument with a sales clerk. But Thaw's family and his fortune were always there to bail him out of trouble whatever his reckless and crazy behavior. And he really did have a lot of psychological problems. He used to talk baby talk at the age of 36. Thaw could also be quite charming. And when Evelyn Nesbitt's relationship with her benefactor, Stanford White, finally went south, Harry Thaw was there to pick up the pieces. He began to court Nesbitt relentlessly. Thaw knew that Nesbitt dated White, and he knew all about White's reputation as a womanizer. But he never heard about how White pursued her. They went on vacation together. Uh, during the summer in 1903, and on that occasion, Evelyn told Harry about the rape. And this was the first time she'd ever told anybody about the rape. And from that moment on, Harry Thor became obsessed with Stanford White. And his persistent courtship of Nesbitt proved successful. He asked her to marry him several times, and then she finally agreed to marry him, which she did at the age of 19, and I think it's uh, 
symbolic that the she wore a black dress to the wedding. <laughs> the newlyweds moved back to Pittsburgh and settled down. For a while, Harry Thaw seemed almost, well, sane. Harry and Evelyn enjoyed a few months of marital bliss in their hometown, but Thaw could not keep his mind off Stanford White and what he had done to his wife. For the last year, he had been becoming more and more obsessed with having her retell the story of how White had taken advantage of her and seduced her. Then, in the summer of 1906, Harry and Evelyn stopped in New York on their way to a European vacation. Harry proposed that they see a show at a somewhat surprising venue. Stanford White's Rooftop Theater at Madison Square Garden. And Evelyn said to herself, this is really weird because I can't believe Harry would want to be anywhere near knowing a building that was associated with me and with White. It was an unseasonably hot day, even for New York in June. That day, the hippopotamus in the Central Park Zoo collapsed and died from heat exhaustion, a story that would take a back page in the following day's newspaper to what was about to happen at Madison Square Garden. It's, you know, 100 degrees. It's They're out in an outdoor uh, rooftop theater, and Harry's wearing this heavy overcoat, which I think he did because he was concealing the gun because he couldn't hide it very well in his tuxedo. Harry and Evelyn took in the performance. A little before 11 p.m., the garden's owner emerged from his private residence to join the audience. Evelyn watched Harry, who stood up at Stanford White's appearance with a glazed look in his eyes. She suggested that her husband leave the show. And as they were going towards the exit, Harry broke away, went to the front of the theater where Stanford White was sitting in his usual seat. And then in front of hundreds of theater goers, pulls out his pistol and fires three shots and instantly kills Stanford White. Harry Thaw stood over his victim. Then he held the gun up and said I, to anybody that was still around him, he said, I did it because he ruined my wife. Three chorus girls fainted on the stage floor. The orchestra kept playing. Harry rejoined his wife and a distraught Evelyn cried, oh Harry, what have you done? He kissed her on the cheek and said, it's all right, dear. I have probably saved your life. Harry was arrested and taken down the garden's elevator. He calmly lit a cigarette when he exited the building. Up next, the criminal trial and the love triangle that shocked America. Harry Thaw was forced to call on his family yet again to bail him out and to embrace an unprecedented but brilliant new legal defense strategy to save himself from the electric chair. Don't miss the new CBS All Access original series that will make you ask yourself, what dimension are you even in? Stream The Twilight Zone, hosted and narrated by Academy Award winner Jordan Peele, in a role made famous by the classic show's creator, Rod Serling. The mind-bending reimagining will take you through the genres of sci-fi, horror, and fantasy to explore humanity's hopes, fears, prides, and prejudices in a way you've never thought possible, until now. Not only does The Twilight Zone offer a new take on a television classic, it also features an all-star cast, including Seth Rogen, Adam Scott, John Cho, Greg Kinnear, Allison Tolman, and more. Enter a new dimension, not only of sight and sound, but of mind. The Twilight Zone is now streaming exclusively on CBS All Access. New episodes every Thursday. Cross over into another dimension. Visit cbs.com slash thread tz to redeem your free trial today. That's cbs.com slash thread tz to redeem your free trial of CBS All Access. Every decade has its trial of the century. When I've talked about this as being the trial of the century, there are people who say, well, there was Leopold and Loeb and there's Manson and there's OJ. And I said, well, okay, but this was the first trial of the 20th century. Just a week after the murder, Thomas Edison's studio put out a hastily made film reenactment of the crime, which audiences across the country swarmed to watch. Teddy Roosevelt, the president of the United States, worried that the trial would distract Americans from their work, and even tried to suppress the transcripts from the trial on the grounds that the sordid material would ruin public virtue. One newspaper columnist summarized it, A rich man has been killed. A rich man did the killing. 
and so a world sits up to hear the tale in every red and dripping particular. It was the breaking point between the old and the new in terms of the Victorian era versus now what would become, you know, modern America with the media circus and people using their money and influence to try to get around the law. New York's district attorney was determined to put Thaw in the electric chair for the murder of one of the city's most prominent citizens. Thaw's family hired a team of high-powered attorneys to fight back. But there was one big obstacle, Harry Thaw. So his attorneys wanted to actually claim that he was insane when he fired the gun. But he said to his attorneys, no way. I'm perfectly sane. I did, I did the act. And in fact, I should have been given a medal for getting rid of this pedophile and this rapist. Well, Harry, of course, Harry really was delusional because he thought after he shot White that he was going to be hailed as the conquering hero who had saved all of the young women of New York from, from Sanford White. So Thaw's attorneys had to put aside the insanity defense and try something else. And so in the trial, the attorneys, what they do is they come in with a defense that is dictated by Harry Thaw, which is that the homicide was justifiable. They settled on what might be called an honor-killing defense, based on a kind of vigilante notion that there was an unwritten law that a man had the right to defend his wife's honor. It succeeded in many, many cases, particularly in the southern states, that if you were the husband of a woman who had been attacked, assaulted, or raped, you had the right to go and take your revenge on the, uh, the, the assailant. The New York newspapers had a field day with it but the unwritten law was essential to Thaw's defense. They even gave it a name. They called it, in Harry's case, Dementia Americana, which is one of my favorite terms. And they hired all these alienists who were, you know, the precursors to psychiatrists to come in at $1,000 a day to testify that uh, Harry was suffering terribly because of this uh, Dementia Americana. Thaw's lawyers tried to refocus the case away from Thaw's own conduct and on to the sordid behavior of the man whose conduct had prompted the crime, Stanford White. One of the first witnesses was a, um, a cab driver who used to bring people to Madison Square Garden. And when they asked if he was surprised about what happened, he said, no, I was just surprised that it, that it was a husband that killed him. I always thought it would be a father. Shocking tales of White's prolific womanizing began to surface and the dead man's conduct became a central part of Harry Thaw's defense. The thing, of course, if you say it's a justifiable homicide, why is it justifiable? Because Stanford White raped Evelyn. But who is going to testify that the rape happened? There's only one witness, by necessity, and that's Evelyn Nesbitt. And so everything depended on her testimony, and she's only 21 years old. And Evelyn finally decided she didn't want to see Harry go to the electric chair, so she gets up on the stand, tells her story, uh, about what White did, and they were they were pushing her to say that he had drugged her and raped her, and um, she went along with this story. America was gripped by Evelyn's testimony. So was the defendant. Several times Harry sat forward in his chair and gripped the table so hard his knuckles turned red. When she finished recounting the tale of her deflowering, he broke down and cried. Thanks in part to Evelyn's convincing testimony, however, many Americans came to see Harry Thaw as a kind of moral crusader, defending women like Evelyn against monsters like Stanford White. Harry became, as Evelyn herself put it, America's pet murderer. That status, however, was not enough to get him acquitted. Surprisingly enough, even though he went and shot a man <laughs> in cold blood in front of a thousand people, it was a hung jury. In April 1907, after 47 hours of deliberations, the jury announced it was hopelessly deadlocked regarding the guilt of Harry Thaw. Imagine if there had been a second O.J. Simpson trial. Could the nation have handled another such spectacle? Well, in January 1908, less than a year after the hung jury, everyone reconvened for the second trial of Harry K. Thaw. This time, Harry's counsel was not going to take anything off the table. The next lawyer convinced Mother Thaw, if you don't allow us to do, to go with the insanity plea, he will be convicted. Make no bones about it. He is going to be convicted, and he will go to the electric chair. Pleading insanity was not much of a stretch, either. Harry had such a smorgasbord of illnesses, it was almost like, where do you begin with this? And so they came up with the term of a brainstorm. 
that uh, Harry was suffering from a temporary brainstorm after Evelyn had told him one too many times about the uh, her affair with White. But proving temporary insanity or a brainstorm was a delicate matter. You know, it was unusual. This whole notion of the insanity defense was not something that was really well known. And there was such a... Um, a bias against the notion of any kind of mental illness, of any of insanity. You know, this is the age where people would be locked up away from sight. There was no attempt to try to cure people of mental illnesses uh, at this point. Thaw and his family pulled out all the stops when it came to demonstrating Thaw's mental instability. Fortunately, there were plenty of witnesses willing to testify to it. Simon Botts again. The defense was really to present witnesses from way, way back, many, many witnesses from all different periods of Harry Thor's life who would testify to Thor's eccentric and irration, apparently irrational behavior. And so you would have um, nursemaids who would say that when Harry was a child, he was uncontrollable. You would have teachers come in from his schools who were saying that he never learned anything, so on and so forth. But what was truly insane was the amount of money that Thaw's family spent on a team of 12 expert witnesses. It cost close to $1,000 a day for each of the dozen psychiatric experts. The defense desperately wanted to show that Thaw was temporarily unmoored from reality, that his unstable personality merely acted impulsively when he was confronted by his wife's mistreatment at the hands of Stanford White. The real sticking point was whether Thaw planned White's murder. It's very difficult to know whether the murder was premeditated. And it's an important point, of course, because if it was premeditated, then it's intentional, then Harry Thor knows what he's doing. Thaw was obsessed with Stanford White and often had him followed by detectives. He almost certainly knew that White would be present at the show that night. He carried a gun inside a heavy overcoat on a sweltering summer evening. But... Thaw also started to leave the theater that night with Evelyn before he turned and decided to go after White. And there was no question about his motive for the murder and that he did it in a fit of rage. This time, the jury deliberated for just 24 hours. The jury, in fact, they, they agreed with the defense and they came back with a verdict that he was not guilty by reason of insanity. Harry Thaw's acquittal on grounds of insanity was hardly the end of his troubles. He was convinced that he would just say he had a temporary brainstorm, and then he would get off. That was not the case. They put him in the uh, in the asylum upstate for the criminally insane, and um, it took him another six years to get out. It was a very unhappy situation, as you can imagine, for Harry Thor, who, of course, thought he was perfectly sane and thought he had done the world a, a great favor by killing Stanford White. Harry and Evelyn eventually divorced. After the trial, her life and career would never be the same. She descended into alcoholism and drug abuse. She lived with a pet boa constrictor. She went from celebrity to curiosity. For a brief period, she went into vaudeville. She was in singing in nightclubs. Um, she had gotten into uh, a morphine addiction because she had hurt herself. All those years of modeling, she had, she had developed problems with her neck and her back. Before her death in 1967, her life became the basis for the 1954 film, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, starring a young actress named Joan Collins as Evelyn. Harry Thaw continued to insist that he was never crazy, long after he was released from the asylum. He even wrote a book about it. When I discovered this transcript, the original typed manuscript of his book, it has all of his notes and marginalia on it, and scrawled across it in giant letters, he wrote, I was not insane. <laughs> which I just think is just hilarious. The case of Harry Thaw was not the first celebrity love triangle to end in murder and captivate the American public with a legal defense based on insanity. Harry Thaw's lawyers had a precedent to point to from nearly half a century earlier. Next week on The Thread, the murder of Barton Key, the playboy son of Francis Scott Key, the author of the American National Anthem. It was said that he once reportedly bragged that he only needed 36 hours with any woman uh, to get her to do whatever he wanted. But one of those women happened to be the wife of a very powerful and mentally unstable congressman. People often portray Key as a victim, but yeah, you know, Key, you could kind of argue, was a little bit of a, uh, a scumbag too. And I think uh, that this might be one of those stories where there really are no good guys. Barton Key was shot to death in broad daylight by a sitting U.S. congressman just yards from the White House. 
Yeah, I mean, literally, if it was an episode of House of Cards, you wouldn't believe it, right? But it really happened. I heard him say so often they could love their wives alone. But I think that is rubbish, mammas have hearts made of snow. Now my heart is made of soft of stuff, it melts at each warm glance. A pretty girl can't look my way without a new romance. I could love a million girls and every girl a twin. I could love a Chinese girl and ask him for a pen. I could love a German girl, a girl with golden curls. But in fact, I think that I could love about a million girls. The Thread is produced by Robert Kulos, Sophia Perpetua, and me, Sean Braswell. Chris Hoff engineered our show. This episode features Rawhide performing I Could Love a Million Girls. To learn more about The Thread, visit aussie.com slash the thread, all one word. And make sure to subscribe to The Thread on Apple Podcasts, follow us on iHeartRadio, or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out at aussie.com or on Twitter and Facebook. If you love surprising, engaging stories from history, look no further than the flashback section of aussie.com. That's ozy.com. 